you know, the thing that you love and inspire by the most are the, is the thing that the thing that you should um, that you know more about than anyone else. Like there's this thought that, well, you, you know, you're not in the business, so you don't know anything. Right. But what you, you know, you don't know anything and anything in quotes means all the things that, you know, are the complexities and nuance of, of being in the movie business. But what you do know is what your idea is. You have command of your idea and you have command over what story you want to tell. This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Steve Pickman. How are you doing, Steve? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Like I was telling you earlier, but I've been I've been a fan of yours for a while. Uh, you know, watching uh, the insanity that is your filmography over the years. I appreciate that. I do. I do. With all the love, the insanity, with all the love in the world. Yeah, I mean, for for good or ill, I willingly engaged in all the madness. You know that I chose to engage in. So I I have no. I can't run from it. I'm responsible. So first question, brother. How and why did you want to get into this insanity that? is the film industry well i didn't really know it was going to be that insane although i will say i kind of lived a pretty chaotic life growing up so it didn't actually feel that insane to me um i i i I grew up with a for for whatever reason um maybe my social group maybe my upbringing um a really strong sense of the absurd like i thought the world was insane at a very early age maybe because i had jobs really early i actually i worked at a um I worked at a bar uh, in the eighth grade um, as a busboy and dishwasher. Uh, I worked Wednesday, Friday, Saturday nights um, till midnight on Wednesday nights and then till one or two in the morning on Friday, Saturday. And then by the time I was a sophomore in high school, I was the short order cook and at that same restaurant. So I did there was a pizza side and a restaurant side. And I did, you know, Italian beef, burgers, chicken, you know, whatever, you know, all you know, sandwiches, stuff like that. So um you know maybe just my exposure to the world just made me think everything is crazy adults are crazy um and so i felt really comfortable i guess in in the world of chaos um that's uh, that's the only thing i could really attribute it to um so no i didn't think it was that that insane when i first started i mean i do now of course but i didn't <laughs> Didn't really know. I love that. I love it. But now, of course, I mean, obviously now I understand. But because well, we we ran away to the circus. I mean, that's that's the insanity of what we do as filmmakers. We we run away. With yeah, the I mean, we're in, yeah. I mean, we're engaged in storytelling. I mean, to me, when you're engaged in storytelling, and the more I do it, the more I've done it, the, re- I, the I realize I've been telling stories to myself outside the film industry my whole life. Like we tell, like we, we're, you know, like narrative. It took me a long time to realize that everything was narrative. Like I was like, well, there's real life. And then there's, you know, then there's creating dramatic narrative for film and television or theater or whatever. And then I'm like, wait a minute. It's terrifying to, of course, realize that there is no no difference. You're capturing, you know, moments in time or characters on journeys to tell stories inside, you know, the uh, dramatic content or a comedy or whatever. And then we as an audience all view it. Right. But to pretend like we go home and be like, oh, yeah, that's just you know, that's just the movies. And, and, and now I'm living in reality separate from that um, is false, you know? And so once I realized that it actually made me feel both worse and better, mm-hmm. if that makes sense, um, sure, sure. because um, that's just what we're engaged in. And so if you're engaged in it all the time, it can drive you crazy. Like there are people who are just like, okay, enough, like you're in a narrative. I get it. Just live your life, like enjoy your life and live it. And don't, you know, be so analytical and neurotic all the time about everything. But I, you know, I can't help it. So um, <laughs> what was I saying? So uh, <laughs> exactly, exactly, uh, sir. Exactly. Yeah so, yeah. so, I mean, yeah. So I think being, you know, and, you know, being engaged in a creative field your whole life is, you know, is, a, is an interesting choice. And I, I love it. And, and, and it's caused me all kinds of terrors. But I think that's probably true to be fair of everything anyone does in life. You know, like I'm, I would never not say that someone who owned a restaurant feels any different. <laughs> Oh no, absolutely. I mean, I've I've owned retail before and it's it's insane. It's an insanity uh to do any there's insanity in all levels. It's just that we're the most high, we're one of the most high profile of levels of insanity because everyone sees what we do and uh, consumes much of what we do as well. Now, is there something that you wish someone would have told you at the beginning of your career? If you could go back in time and talk to yourself, what would be the one thing you might do? Do you know what you really need to look out for? It's this. 
Um, wow, that's a really interesting and good question. You know, if I listen, you know, I said, as, as I said before we went on that I'd listened to a few of your podcasts and they're really fascinating and great and you have great Thank guests. You. But I should have searched the podcast, you know, more deeply so that I could have <laughs> had an answer. I could have borrowed the answer to that question from one of your other guests. <laughs> Something someone would have said to me that I wish they had told me. Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, um like God, for me, for me, for me, like if it was me, I answering my own question, uh, patience, man, it's going to take you a lot longer than you think it's ever going to take you to do what you want to do. Yeah, um, I think that's true. I mean, I was very, very lucky in the way I got in, but I, I, um, so I didn't feel that as much. And maybe that was a curse in and of itself. I, I, I think the other thing is it's way harder. And I heard Ed's week talking about this, so maybe that comes to mind. It is way more difficult to actually execute the thing that you want to execute even when you get the opportunity so like you have these dreams of doing it right and then you even get the opportunity to do it and then you're in front of it doing it and then you fail utterly and you're like well wait um you know i thought that i would once i got the moment i'd be able to because i think it's tricky there's so many elements to doing something that's good and interesting you know, when you're on the floor and you have a camera and you have a script and all of your actors, you still have to kind of, you know, be open to, uh, you know, this thing, this magic. And I hate, you know, using that word, but, you know, this magical thing kind of has to happen. Even if you have all the elements, you know, under your control, you still have to create it, you know, create an environment and then get lucky or create an atmosphere and then get lucky where something cool and interesting happens that that matches what you had in mind. Um, when you cast it and when you, you know, built the, you know, when you built the set or, or, or cast the actors and rehearsed. And so, so it's an, the, so it's that kind of intangible thing. And so I, I think, um, uh, I, I think I took that for granted a little bit, or it's not that I took it for granted. I just was not aware. Of it. So if someone said to me, Hey man, you know, yeah. be aware, you know, it's, 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 it's going to be so much more difficult the more you do it, not less. Well, uh, well, get I mean, better and better and better, and it's never ending, you know. Well, it's compromise. That's all we do as directors is compromise. It's like every day, no matter how much money you have, no matter who's in front of the camera, you got to compromise your vision in many ways. And a lot of times it's better than what you ever thought of when you, when you allow that magic to happen. Uh, it's when the director wants to control every little thing is when if you hold on too tight, it's like trying to hold on to water. Like it just slips right through your fingers. Yeah. I mean, art, you know, there, I, I'm sure there, this is probably a cliche. Someone wrote down somewhere, but art is limitation, right? So you are limited by whatever you are limited by in any given moment. Um, and, you know, money might not be your limitation in that moment. You're, the sun could be your limitation, you know, right. the, location. Be million, the, location. the location could be your limitation. Like there's so many different things. And, you know, that's why, you know, you, I used to be really angry when I'd see, you know, movies that had what would would seemingly seemingly well when you see a movie with seemingly li limitless budget, you know, and then it's not good, you have that, you know, you have that oh, yeah. well, besides, besides the Schadenfreude or whatever, you, you have that feeling, you're like, well, why? Like, right. was it because you had a lack of limitation? And so you just went, you know, because of that lack of limitation, you weren't critical in terms of like what you needed to tell a good story. Um or were you limited by things I didn't even, you know, that are far, you know, beyond me. And those limitations are what kept you from telling a good story, you know, because it's hard to get your head around, you know, when it's 150 or $200 million movie, how it could be, how it could, you know, not, not work, not work. And so, right. and so I think, yeah, I think it's a constant struggle for all of us at every level. Um, yeah. It is frustrating to see a movie that has, and I watch them all the time. You know, you watch something on Netflix and you're like, who gave them money? Like, why? Like, how did that happen? You know, and then you've got- Well, there's always something you know is the reason, right? You can say, oh, well, because of this or because of It that. was the actor, it was the location, it was the, the, the executives, this, you know, the script was, you know, they had to rush it to get it out before. There's a thousand things that could happen, but it's still frustrating when you when you see something like that, especially when you're in the business and you're like, well, I, and then of course, in, a, in the back of every director's head, we're like, well, we could have done better than that. <laughs> Well, I, I also think like, yeah, I mean, I also think like, you know, I would try my damnedest to do better if I had all the resources, right? I mean, I don't really think, hey, I could have done that better as much as I think like I was like, boy, you know, I would have liked the shot to be on the floor instead of you. <laughs> you know, 
Like, is it, I don't know if I could have done it better, but shit, I couldn't have done it worse. Right, exactly. And it's fascinating because, I mean, I've had the pleasure of talking to some directors who have, you know, worked in those $200 million, $150 million budgets. And I always ask them, I'm like, what's it like, you know, working in that environment where you've got like the biggest movie stars in the world and anything you want. Like, I remember when I was coming up uh, in high school, True Lies was shooting in Miami. And, you know, Jim Cameron was already Jim Cameron at that point. And I went on I went on the set. I was, you know, just hanging out, not on the set, but like, you know, outskirts of the set. And I just remember seeing that Jim had every toy you can imagine sitting there. Techno, steady, helicopter, everything just in case he wanted it. Not like I need the techno for the day. No, 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 no. The techno was there the entire shoot in case something he gets tickled to do a techno shot. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And you, you know, looking at his work, you're like, yes, you deserve yes. to have everything at your disposal. Absolutely. Like for sure. I mean, sure. Just every every brush do you want, sir, you should have. Chris Nolan, David Fincher, they, they these kind of filmmakers, they need what give them what they want. Yeah. And I bet they, they, I bet they also have, I bet they're also very good at planning, you know, like the more they dial in that, which they're going to do, um, you know, the, you know, like all of their shots are so planned and they're so smart about what they're doing that, um, you know, that you, you're not just, you're not just deciding to, you know, get on, get it, you know, put a camera in the helicopter, like spontaneously. And and maybe even they have the opportunity to do that, but it's beyond all their planning for sure. You know, without question. question. You mentioned, now you mentioned that you kind of had a break early on. What was that first big break for you? Well, I was very lucky because I, um, uh, so I met John Cusack in high school because um, we, well, we became friends, but we became friends through a, a like a student run comedy variety show that the, that, that, that was kind of like, it still runs today. It's like a very famous, like, you know, it's one of those, you know, 50 year running variety shows that they do every year that the student run, students run. And um, I applied to be the writer director my senior year. Um, and so did John and so did two other guys. And so then we found ourselves, you know, the summer before our senior year writing the show together. And that's how we became friends. And then. And but know, John was already John. I mean, he was already yeah. he, he's acting already. He was already a star. I mean, quote unquote, a star in, in the eight, an 80 star already. He already done better yeah. off dead and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, it's really, yeah, but he had done better. Nah, I don't know if he had done better off dead actually. Not yet, um, but he had been working. He'd already been working. Oh yeah, he did the shirt. He had done he, I think he was just doing the shirt thing. He had done class, yeah. I believe. I think class had come out. But you know, it's interesting. I went to a huge public high school. We had like almost four thousand kids, and there were so many really hot there were so many high flyers in all these different categories that it actually John wasn't, he, you know, obviously he was the, he was, you know, he was famous and he got a lot of attention for being, you know, this young actor who might be a movie star, but, you know, it was just a very competitive public high school. So it never really felt like out of proportion. Like there were plenty, like there was like, oh yeah, John's the really cool actor. It's like, oh, there's the guy who's going to the NBA. There's, you know, right. like there, there's, you know, our class valedictorian is going to Harvard, like, and she's, you know, going to do great things. Like, um, oh, and like one of our closest friends went on to be nominated for a Pulitzer in journalism. She was already running the school newspaper wow. and then went to the, I think, Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern. Like there were just so many from from our perspective, there's so many people doing so many amazing. So he was things. one of many very cool people. Yeah, I mean, it all seemed to balance out. You know, there were like there was like 900, I think, in our graduating class. And there was at least, uh, you know, maybe 150 or 200 people that uh, I think was like this community of ours. You know, we were all doing so, you know, really cool. And I I, I feel like everyone's doing really cool things. But in any case, we, um, you know, full of ourselves, obviously. Um, and um, so, yeah, so then um, over the years through co- while I was going to college, um Johnny uh, started uh, working with Tim Robbins uh, in a theater company called The Actors Gang. Then I went and did a show with the um, with the Actors Gang um, in between, uh, like in the summers between going to school. And um, I actually got replaced by Jack Black uh, for a show in 1980. I'm dating myself in the late 80s uh, uh, because I had to go back to Berkeley and the show extended. So then Jack took over my part, which I think I only had 12 lines and I moved a lot of scenery, frankly. So anyway. <laughs> It's true. And then Johnny uh, and I formed a theater company with a bunch of other actors called New Crime Productions. And um, I was after college, I was a social worker, actually. Um, 
for the, for out, for the I was an outreach caseworker for the homeless mentally ill. That was my job after college. And Johnny had gone out to L.A. Uh, and I was running the theater company and working as a social worker. And he um, he had got a producing deal. Um, Brandon Tartikoff, who was a, a like a legendary network chief, uh, was like went on to um, run Paramount Pictures. He gave John a producing deal. And then John asked me to run the company uh, with him. And so that's how I got my start. So I was extremely. So it's, uh, it's, the, it's a story that everyone everyone goes to that. I mean, that's yeah. the obvious. It's the obvious story. I mean, I, too, became good friends with Brad Pitt. And yeah. uh, I've been working with Brad for years now. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> the lucky, it's a lucky and ridiculous uh, event yeah. to have, have happened to me to walk. That's amazing. The door. It was amazing. And then, you know, you know, the. So I was very, very lucky. And then we were still tasked with, with doing something good. Um, and that there's that challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had to actually, you know, and I felt so, the pressure of that too, you know, like we were young men and it was, I was started to run his company and it, and it was challenging um, to get to know the business from that vantage point and then try and create something with John that stood out and would be uh, something that we wanted that, that, you know, stood out as, as the kind of, movie and stories we wanted to tell him to. Um, and that's a challenge, especially since, you know, um, again, it's, you know, we walk to, to have the opportunity to walk through that door is just, it's just beyond extraordinary. So once you start talking about, well, it was hard once we got in, you know, anyone listening is like, yeah, well, you just had like this golden ticket. So how hard was it? Yeah. Um, it's hard to, so, so just put, you know, so it's hard to kind of rep, you know, to, yeah, like that is true. Uh, but then you, because you have to do something good and you have to contend with the industry and actually get movies made and try and do it, um, you know, I felt like it's square and, one anyway. Right, exactly. And, you know, and because I've been able to talk to so many of these these uh, filmmakers who've had these kind of lottery ticket moments, I mean, you had kind of a lot, a long lottery ticket moment with, you know, meeting, just happened to become friends with John Cusack at the time of his career when this was all going on and you guys gelled and it worked. But then you got people like Kevin Smith or Robert Rodriguez or Ed Burns or any of these guys. And the fun thing I've always discovered talking to all these guys uh, is that you might have been lucky getting in the door, right place, right time, right movie, right situation. There's a lot of those kind of stories through Hollywood, but staying in the door is where the work starts. So yeah, you might've had a little bit of an opening, but man, it's not easy staying in that room. You could get invited in that room, but you could have easily just been like, and security <laughs> very easily. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the doors, the door opens, as you know, the door opens and closes and you have to keep prying it open. You know, I think that, you know, there's very few filmmakers, even legendary ones who have like whole palaces of doors open for them. Um, mm -hmm. I that still wake up in the morning with, you know, a crowbar ready to pry a door open. Absolutely. Um, I think that's just what we do. Um, uh, and it's just it's just the nature of it. And so I um, that's true of me for sure. Um, and it continues to this day. Um, that can be my segue to The Wheel. Um, mm -hmm. Which we'll because, get, we're going to get to your new movie, The Wheel, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, well, we can talk about that later, but like that's another, just another example of something when we get to it that um, that it was like, oh, I see an opportunity to do something and to explore something that I hadn't had the opportunity, that I haven't had the opportunity to do. And, you know, when you go down that road, it's just like anything else, you know, you're just, you continue to want to work and, and try and make something good. And that's what we do for a living. So, I mean, you were obviously involved with one of my favorite movies of the 90s, Gross Point Blank. It is such an insane idea. Uh, you know, a hitman goes back to his, his high school reunion and he's having issues. And it was such a brilliant film. How did you, is that something that came from you, from you and John? How did that whole, because it, like I tell people, that movie would never get made today. Just wouldn't get made today in the studio system. It would be very difficult. Yeah, although it would be made in television, right? You know, like could, I, I, I feel um, could be a series, absolutely. Could be yeah, series. I mean, I, I feel like Barry uh, has some, you know, it is reminiscent in a great, and they, they, they've like taken off and done. Like, if I could have made the series, if like if there was more stories around that, um, I mean, but those guys did an extraordinary, you know. That, I love that show so much. Oh, it's so I love good. It so because good. of things it reminds me of from my first movie, and then all the things that they're that all the things they've done to to explore that concept is so brilliant and so <laughs> fun, and I love it so much. Um, and so, um, you know, the I just have to say, it sounds horrible that I'm saying this because it sounds like, oh, great, I thought of Barry, which is not the case. Like I 
stole all kinds of things to make gross point blank happen right like the president's analyst which is this quirky weird 70s movie about um yeah i think these bad guys trying to kill the, the psychiatrist of the president i believe although it's been so many years um like there were all kinds of movies like that um that i loved and influenced me um mm-hmm. and so by no means am i saying and i don't even know if i influence them in any way it's just we share a similar idea mm-hmm. um uh so I don't want to be kind of misconstrued as in, no, in, of course, of course. Regard, but, how, uh, so, but how, so how did that how did that come to be? Oh, so um, yeah, so I we got this deal at Paramount, and then um, we would get you know submissions in, and I didn't even know that you weren't supposed to read unsolicited material. Um, I didn't, I didn't know the right. distinction. Um, you know, I guess the answer to your earlier question, which is, you know, what you what do you wish someone would have told me prior to getting into Hollywood? And I guess the answer would have been, well, everything about producing because I didn't know anything. No one told me anything. I was just suddenly sitting in an office in in Paramount. I mean, at Paramount Pictures, and I was trying to like figure out like what would be the process of thinking of an idea or creating an idea and then, you know, getting it made made into a movie. And so I got this script. uh, It was written by this guy, Tom Jankowitz. Um, It was unsolicited, you know. Um, And, um, you know, that's the other thing, like, you know, companies don't take unsolicited material because they're afraid they'll be sued if people steal their ideas, et cetera. And I was like, well, they could sue me. I'm a social worker, you know, like, like six weeks earlier, I was (laughs) was making $17,000 a year. So, you know, Mm -hmm. be your worst, but, but I, I, but that's just a joke. I I wasn't actually even thinking about it in those terms. Um, I simply didn't know. So I read the script and it's really amazing. It's kind of a straightforward actioner. I meet with the, you know, and it strikes me as is like a brilliantly and beautifully ironic idea and funny. Um, and um, and so I I talked to Tom Jankowitz about it. He, you know, he was OK with DVD Vincentis, who became my for a long time, long time writing partner. Um, and we just had kind of a, a vision for the movie that Tom didn't necessarily share. He wasn't against it, but he was just kind of like, you know, I wrote the movie I wrote. But if you guys want to revise it go ahead. So we, we said, great. So we came out, so we, you know, started figuring out like how to, where our approach was to kind of subvert all the expectations of the movie. So like, for instance, in Tom Jankowitz's version, um, there was the bully he goes back and see, but in the bully version, there's like a big fight, right? And he fights the bully and wins. And we thought to ourselves, well, you know, the bully isn't your enemy anymore. He's probably, as an assassin, going to have real enemies. And so, like, what is the subversion of expectation with the bully? And, and that is that he's not this scary, terrible person who tormented you in high school. Um, and in this case, he's a sad drunk who writes poetry, right? So, you know, we, you know, and then, you know, the father who would be angry that he left his, you know, that he left his daughter, that John's character left um, his daughter, you know, standing in the doorway, and never having picked her up for prom, he would be angry, right? Well, no, because he's a corporate, he's a corrupt corporate raider of a certain kind. And so he has an affinity with, with John Cusack's character because they're both men of the world who are corrupted by that world and therefore share a bond. And so it was kind of all these little kind of tropes or touchstones that we looked at uh, and wanted to mess with. And, you know, we were fortunate enough. Um, it was actually... The movie was originally after we revised it and took it to market. Um, it was um, first bought by John Cali, who was mm. a famous filmmaker um, or studio boss um, who had made you know uh, Kubrick's movies, and he was kind of uh, they were there. Was, it was yet another version of the United Artists MGM like being reconstituted at that time. Right. And, so so United Artists was becoming an active studio again, and John Kelly was running it. He was the one who originally bought the movie. Um, and that was, you know, just amazing um, that he <laughs> bought the movie and saw its potential. Um, and then it ended up getting turned around. He ended up not being able to make it and was so gracious about giving it back to us. That's another thing, you know, just that's wow. another piece of luck. Yeah, like you don't, you know, my career is just a series of 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 luck of lucky moments in which um you know and maybe that's true of so many of us um but so john kelly couldn't make the movie and he was really gracious about giving back to us which is i didn't know not a thing like my attitude was oh yeah well great if you can't make the movie then we get to go make it, yeah we get to go make it somewhere else it was only later that i found out that that's not actually a thing and his generosity was extraordinary so he gave us the movie back i'm sure i'm not sure so jen joe roth and roger birnbaum who would who had who had a kind of mini they had a huge producing company uh called caravan um mm-hmm. and they ended up taking on the movie and donna roth 
Joe's wife and soon and Susan Arnold were the producers. And so it was actually Donna and, and Susan who brought it to Roger and Joe and Roger and Joe agreed to make the movie. Um, and so that's how it happened. Um, so it was, a, again, a series of kind of lucky things that fell our way. Um, now, after, movie. So I, that movie, if, if I remember correctly, was a fairly decent hit. I mean, it wasn't a blockbuster monster hit, but it was a decent hit yeah. enough, enough that the town would, you know, like, oh, these guys are doing some cool stuff. Yeah, I think I remember, I could be wrong about this, I'd have to ask my colleagues, but I believe that um, it got really good long lead press. And so they gave it a slightly better release, um, I think, or much better release. I think that it was going to be released maybe, um, and again, I, I didn't really know anything about these kinds of things. I just remember hearing that it was our release was pushed and it was because of long lead press. So I'm now repeating that story, you know, 25 years later. But so then it was like, then we knew that maybe we had something, you know, that was maybe good and that maybe people would go see. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, yeah, I think it did well, although it was really funny because, you know, I think Anaconda came out. This it was 97. So, yeah. Weekend, and I think we got crushed. And I remember thinking. <laughs> well, J-Lo, yeah, I mean, it was, it was J-Lo, man. Come yeah, J-Lo, it was amazing. 97. Yeah, I think I went and saw that. I, I'm sure I went and saw that movie that weekend or the weekend after because it was in the same is, theater. And, is and this, I think we got crushed by Anaconda. And I was like, well, yeah, that movie's awesome. I'm thinking, is this pre Con Air or post Con Air? Pre. I, this was the first movie. Gross Point Blank was kind of the first movie that we did together. Um, and it was definitely the first movie um that johnny uh that john cusack had a gun in his hand and that was part of a thing that we discussed actually before um like before the the gross point blank gross point blank came along um and this might sound silly but we did discuss things like well th so at that time there were a lot of uh john had a lot of opportunities to play an fbi agent or play a cop or whatever basically you know all these ideas that would put a gun in his hand and we just kept saying we had this line where we were like well if you're gonna have a gun in your hand you should have a gun in your hand ironically and we didn't exactly <laughs> We didn't exactly know what that meant, you know, but we were like, yeah, because we don't necessarily want you to be a hero with a gun. Like we were just kind of fundamentally against that. We didn't know what that creatively did for him, you know, like what is that for you as, a, as an actor and as a the kind of characters you play, like what, how does that work exactly? And so, you know, to be an assassin uh, and a kind of anti-hero made absolute sense, right? Because then he could be... Well, he's you know, perfect. He was, because he could question his very existence, and his existence is killing people with guns. And so I was like, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. Right, exactly. Um, now, after that, you did another movie, uh, another classic 90s film, High Fidelity, where, I mean, it's, you know, uh, the cast in that is... I, I was looking at the trailer the other day, I was like, Jesus, man, you had everybody in that movie. It was, I mean, it was just, uh, it was, it was insane. And then I, I realized who the director was. Yeah. And I'm like, how in the, how in God's green earth did the guy who did Dangerous Liaisons end up doing High Fidelity? So, what was it like working with Stephen Fears, who's this legendary filmmaker? And what were some lessons that you picked up from him? <laughs> Well, that's a really that's a great question. Um, well, we got Stephen Fears because John had made a movie with him, right? Um, right, and then so so again, you know, this is going to become an unbearable podcast because it was just another lucky moment <laughs> in our lives. Right, let's just um, let's just state this right now. You are a very. Yeah. Did you buy a lottery ticket for the for the Powerball? Please, yeah. just buy one. Buy just one. You don't you only need the one. <laughs> yeah, I bought the cinema lottery ticket, and it, and it, <laughs> it keeps paying it off. Going. Yeah, because Joe Roth, after Gross Point Blank, became he became the chairman of Disney, and he had High Fidelity under the Touchstone banner, and he gave us the book. He said, hey, you guys, what do you think of this book, and what do you think about it as a movie? And we were, it was extraordinary. And, you know, we wrote a script um, that he liked, uh, Joe, I mean, and he said, go find a director. Um, and we go get Stephen Fears. <laughs> and Johnny called Stephen Frears, and Stephen Frears said that he would do it. So, like, okay, this is terrible. We can end this podcast at any point. I mean, I, I did, mean, even out, I, I did, I have struggled quite a bit in my career, and so we, you know, we if we have another seven hours, we can talk about the actual, you know. I'm hitting the highlights here. here. I'm hitting the highlights. If you want, I can go into the bombs if you'd like. Yeah, we can, get into the, <laughs> we can get into things that didn't work. We can get into my struggles over the years. Like that would be, I think, at least no. helpful to balance out this podcast. But, but. But um, okay, so, but just to finish this high point um, before it all went south, I um, we 
we so he we brought Stephen Frears and then we um went through a script pro- process with with Stephen over that was almost probably almost a year in in length um six to nine months I think we rewrote the movie a bunch of times and um I learned you know and then watching him work was just extraordinary you just learned so much but I learned um so many extraordinary things from him um you know like he would talk about and i was constantly interviewing him um you know off the set um and because i just wanted to learn and he would always indulge my questions and you know i would ask him you know really pretentious film school questions like what is style you know i was like what is style like what like what you know like you see if scorsese has a style and tarantino has a style and you know and he's done so many styles, which is why I asked him, because if you look at Prick Up Your Ears or The Hit or Dangerous Liaisons um, the Queen. Uh, or, yeah. or The Queen or even High Fidelity, pretty much every movie he makes, um, Dirty Pretty Things, has a different style. You know, he's kind of a master wizard of it. And his, you know, he thinks and, you know, this is just his opinion, but it's just a really interesting perspective, true or not true, or you can evaluate it's, you know, whether you know, whether it's true or not or your, you know what it means but he said that there is no such thing as style in his mind he's like a director um utilizes what he needs and makes it his disposal what he needs to tell the story he's telling so if he needs to fly the camera you know through a building you know to you know like or, you know if he needs to you know whatever use very it, whatever style he's employing you know with the camera whether it's to lay back and not have the camera be intentional and you don't really notice the camera or whether the camera is like this, you know, crazy flying creature um, that is part of the storytelling. Um, he's like, that is what the director needed to tell the story. Right. So that because of that, that then you say afterwards, well, the director made a film and it looks like this Edgar Wright or Martin Scorsese or, or David Fincher. Um, and you go, oh, well, you know. He this is he's a you know he employed this style as a director to tell the story and Stephen Frears would say no he told he used what he 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 told the story the way he needed to tell the story to make it work and the style comes after you look at it and say oh well that is the style he employed but Stephen Frears would say and maybe he would disagree with him that maybe he would have a different view this many years later I haven't talked to Stephen in many years but then he said to me that's how he views it that's and so the the instructive thing to me about that was okay. Well, then I don't, uh, you know, when I'm looking at shooting any given thing, I'm like, well, how do I tell the story of this moment or how to tell how to tell the story of this? What is this? What is the story of this particular shot? Uh, what is the story? Am I telling uh, what story am I telling in this particular moment? Um, uh, I know that I have all kinds of stylistic choices available to me without getting caught up in saying like, oh, well, I can employ this style, but not that style. Like, what do I need to tell the story most effectively? Well, I mean, if you and you just have to look at someone like Kubrick, who was literally the master of changing genre. I mean, he literally made the movie of every genre. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna make the comedy. I'm gonna make the war movie. I'm gonna make the horror movie. I'm like, and and you just look at his style, and there's certain things that kind of you there's things as far as flavors that you can kind of see throughout his projects, but the stuff that he employed in Doctor Strange Love is not what he did in Eyes Wide Shut. Like a completely different, it's what he needed to do to tell those individual stories. So that's really interesting. That's an interesting. I mean, I I, com- I completely agree with Stephen on that one. Yeah, I I, I, I agree. And you can see it in their work. Like you know, I I love Jane Campion and when you know mm-hmm. Power of the Dog. It was a movie I just loved, but I also loved Sweetie and Angel at My Table back in the day. And that and I'd forgotten how concerned she is with the interior lives of her characters. You know, she'll <laughs> stop everything all the time to oh, the piano like the piano oh yeah 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 the piano it's like really just be in a in a really urgent observational state which i am just amazed by like that because it's it's observational but it, it has this urgency um which i find kind of astounding and that's a wholly different style because it's not the camera isn't moving you know that it's not moving that much um, but yet she achieves that and it's 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 it's, it's really cool so then you you know so after you've had some successes uh, and you've and you've been doing some stuff and then you get a chance to direct your first feature film mm-hmm. with a with a fairly decent budget it's a studio budget you know where you know this is not two hundred million but you this is the first time you're on set running a a big you know studio production 
So what was it like in the movie, by the way, is accepted, which I, I just adore that movie. I thought it was so much fun to watch mm-hmm. that film when it came out. And again, stupid cast, like insane cast that you had back then. What was it like walking on the set f- the first day on your first studio project? Like, do you are you waiting for security to take you off? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I got this like pain in my shoulder that was so so oh, <laughs> that wow. was so sharp that I had to like take a bath like after the shoot day. Like I was like I had to figure out how to loosen up my shoulder. I was so stressed. Oh um, really? Yeah, my shoulder was just you killing. Kicked, kicked it up all day. I, yeah, I was working so hard to like have a successful day that. Make your day. Just make your day in general. Make my day. Do something interesting. You know, make it. You know, like create. You know, creating comedy. I always felt fairly comfortable with actors because I directed a lot of theater. Um, so I was I was always pretty comfortable directing blo- and directing and rehearsing and blocking. Right. I could gin up at least something. You know, gin up enough really interesting and funny stuff. And with great actors, it's not. You know, it's it's something that I, I love and it's something I feel that I'm I'm halfway decent at. So that part was the part that I understood. But then capturing it with the with the camera, you know, was just a wholly different thing because I was I, then I had to learn very quickly, you know, how to get what I was just rehearsing in the camera in the same way I just pictured it in real time, right? Which, or in, in like in, with the naked eye, like, okay, so it's really, really funny to me, but it's not a play. So how do I, how do I keep everything that's really funny and spontaneous about that, um, that I just rehearsed and how do I shoot it so that it still feels spontaneous and funny when we shoot it? And that, that was a learning process that both Universal and Tom Shadiak, the producer, uh, were really, really patient with me in terms of discovering. Um, it also was a little bit hard, I will say, after all these years that, uh, the movie really wanted to be an R-rated movie. You know, it's a guy who starts his own college, yeah. right? So the fact that we could never, that there were no, that there was no, you know, whatever. You know, American, think, there was no, no American college. Pie moments. There was no American Pie moments. If you yeah, there, there was no sex, no drugs, no outrageousness of that, you know, ilk and of that order. And so it made it a little bit harder. So I was like, well, how do I create a kind of, call it edgy lunacy, um, you know, given- Without the going there, right. Yeah, and we did. We did. We found some things. You know, like they let us get away with the fact that the kids, since they're trying to whatever, they're going to renovate a mental hospital and turn it into a college. And they found like, a, you know, the electroshock therapy machine, you know, so they're like shocking each other and drinking what looked like, you know, alcoholic drinks, you know, the things like that, that I kind of got away with that seemed funny because I didn't have anything else at my disposal. But, you know, the actors were also incredibly funny and warm and Gosh. cool. And that, of course, is what, you know, really made it work, you know, most of the time. Um, you know, no. they let me blow up a car. Like, it's a totally absurd, it's a, total, it's a grounded-based film. It's a, it, the, the film is, has a grounded reality to it, but somehow at the very end of the movie, you know, the character whose dream is to be, you know, believes he, had, he, believes he has, like, telekinetic powers, you know, blows up a car right. in his mind. You know, he succeeds in his life goal of college. Um, and the fact that they let us put that in the movie and keep it in the movie was, you know, just funny and you know ridiculous. So, you know, as directors, you know, we all, there's always that day on set, if not every day, but there's that one day that really everything is falling apart. Whether you're losing the sun, you're like, the, the camera, the camera truck crashed along the way, and you've lost your camera. Actors won't come out of something. It, whatever it is, what was that for you on this project on, on Accepted, and how did you overcome that? that overwhelming thing, that feeling that you feel like the entire world is coming crashing down on you. Uh, let's see. What day was that? Um, every, every, I know, every day. I know every day. Like I said, at the beginning, it's every day. But there must have been one day that was really just like, Jesus. Or one day that you remember that you were just like, you know what? This day. Oh. Um, well, there was a day. Um, yeah, there was a day where um, uh, we were shooting the scene where the parents show up. Uh, uh, Justin Long's parents show up and and they have to kind of, he has to give them a tour. And we were rehearsing and I realized I didn't have enough jokes. Like there weren't, there wasn't anything funny going on per se. Like they, they kind of walked down the hall and the dialogue was the dialogue, but I was like, uh oh, like this doesn't seem like our, what, you know, and it was something we probably should have planned for. But I was like, wait, shouldn't they be hiding something? Shouldn't they? 
like what what's the dance that's happening around the parents that the parents are that's just that just ends up out of frame or that they don't see when they turn right. the corner and like what are the things they're trying to hide and what are the things they're trying to present as the real school and we have to kind of just so I, that was that panicked me because I was looking at a whole day of shooting that was not going to be funny and it was a really important scene in the movie and so um, with the help of you know the producers and the actors. And the, all, every department, that was one of the first times I was like, well, what do props have? What does the production designer, what, you know, what, what do we have in terms of the art department? Like what things can we generate? What things would be funny? And I think it's a pretty funny sequence. Had we really, really planned it to like I would today, it would be, you know, 10 times the size. But so then we managed to like, you know, of course, because of Justin and, and him being so funny and being really, really good at being the kind of like, you know, you know, the, the, you know, he was the one who was like, you know, had all the ball, he was juggling, he had all the ball, he kept the balls up in the air. Right. So he was really, really good at playing that tension. And um, so we made a sequence out of it and I think it worked out okay. And it's a funny little sequence, but um, that was the first day I, I realized that there will be times where you arrive on set thinking everything's great and nothing's going to work in terms of like <laughs> what you're about to shoot. And you Pretty have much almost out. every day. <laughs> yeah. And you have to figure out like, you know, and so I never, so, so from that moment, I've never <laughs> taken for granted that something you think that I tend to worry about the scenes that seem that 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 I think are going to go well, like the scenes when you're planning when I'm planning a shoot, the scenes that, you know, seem the big set pieces and, the you know, in, all, in the big shoots, whether they're big parties or big or, or tons of or big hijinks or big what stunts or whatever it is. Those are gets planned so much and you work on it so much that even though there's, you know, whatever, a nervousness around executing them well. Um, and, you know, and, and, a, and a, an attendant amount of worry goes into that. I always I'm now I'm always keep an eye out for the ones that sneak up on you. The one that you think, oh, well, we're going to shoot this in two hours. It's a really funny scene. Everybody gets it. We know what story we're telling. We know <laughs> the actors know what they're doing. This right. scene's going to be no problem. We're going to be out of it by before lunch and then we'll be getting on the rest of the day. But those are the ones that that I that I worry most about. Or I I, I don't know if I sit worry is the right word. Those are the ones that I. I pay attention to cautious. You're cautious about. Them. Yeah, I, I pay attention to them. I spend an extra. I spend extra energy around making sure those scenes will actually work because those are the ones that, if they suddenly don't work, surprise you, and then you know you don't want that. Now, you also uh, had a, a small producing gig with a small young uh, actor named Tom Cruise uh, <laughs> a few years ago as well. Uh, you, did, you you were one of the producers on uh, his film Night and Day with Cameron. And it was Cameron, if you ever remember, Cameron Diaz and him. Um, I, that's now when you when you were a producer on that, that's now you're at a whole other level budget wise and things. Is there any big lessons you learned from producing a film like that? Well, this would be a, a no fun story, but um, I actually didn't work on the film. So what happened was um, uh, it was an idea that I came up with, uh, with Todd Garner, the producer, and a great friend of mine, Patrick O'Neill, who's a great writer, wrote it. And we sold it to Revolution Studios that Joe Roth was running. And at that time, I was attached to produce. Um, with Todd and we were going to make the movie and then it, it got turned around to Fox and it had a very, you know, crazy journey uh, like so many movies do uh, to getting made. And this one ended extraordinarily with uh, extraordinarily, extraordinarily with, uh, you know, James Mangold and right. Tom Cruise <laughs> and Cameron Diaz. But by that point, uh, even Joe Roth and Bob Garner weren't actively producing it. Like they, the whole, you know, I think James Mingle had his producing partner, and 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 so we didn't, we weren't active participants in the making of the film. Um, got it, got it. So, got but it. I was an active participant in in having, you know, and obviously coming up with the idea, having it written, and then you know, kind of, you know, f trying to get it made for years. So, but by that time. Uh, by the time it came around, it wasn't our film anymore. And um, um, yeah, I have extraordinary credits on that movie. <laughs> because, <laughs> well, because, well, but Joe Roth gave me those credits, right? It was a movie that I thought of, that I pitched him, that I had written, <clears throat> that, that, you know, I have a presentation credit. It was going to be my company that produced it, and I was going to be the producer. Um, it's just that it, you know, it got away from me in all these different ways. And, and, you know, I, I'm, you know, it's, I, it's so, it happened so often, you know, like, oh, I, I don't so know what I would have contributed anyway. Like I would have liked to have been a part of it, but I'm not sure at that point that anyone was interested in my opinion about the <laughs> film, you know, like, 
I would have loved to it's, contribute to the but movie, it, but who would have listened to me, frankly? But it's a juggernaut at that point. It's literally just a, this giant machine that's moving forward. And, you know, when you have someone like Tom Cruise and even James Mangold back then, he wasn't James Mangold of today, but he's still a, a very, you know, sure. very, very strong uh, director. Uh, the, that machine is going. It's hard to <laughs> it's hard to yeah. jump on. They certainly didn't need me. Um, I mean, I, I, well, I should say this way, creatively, I think they needed me. I mean, I love the movie, but there was certain like there's there's some DNA in there that um, that was in, that inspired the idea to begin with. Um, mm-hmm. that I wish they had preserved, you know, like but that's my that's me looking at it like they the movie stands on its own and is funny and great in its own way. So it doesn't necessarily need the things I think it needed. Um, right, right. But of course, I have a desire, you know, like in my, you know, this happens to everyone who's made a film or watches a film get made. You think, well, oh, well, I wish it had contained these other things sure. um, that I had in mind, you know, but um, whether they actually needed those things or not, I don't know. Um, Fair um, you know, but um, but I thought I thought it was really fun. Um, I thought Tom Cruise. Didn't it was it was a fun yeah. movie. It was it was a, yeah. it was it was it was unlike his normal films. Uh, yeah, I mean, the whole film. idea was was hero as unreliable narrator. <laughs> Right, right. Exactly. right. It was hero as unreliable narrator of reality, you know. Um, uh, so, yeah. Now, I, the one thing uh, when I was when when you came across my desk uh, to to come on the show, the one question I knew I was going to ask you, and I've actually been dying to ask you this before we even knew that you were going to come on the show, because when this came out into the world, I was like, how on God's green earth did this happen? Hot tub time machine, sir. How did this get birth into the world? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> you first have to ask Josh Heald, and you should have him on the on the show. He's the creator Please. of Kai now. You should definitely have him on the show. He thought of the idea. Um, I he might have even thought of the idea in a hot tub. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, I can't bear. I he's, can't. Well, I mean, by the way, he's absolutely brilliant. And what they're doing with Cobra Kai, I'm obsessed with Cobra Kai. Obsessed yeah. with it. It's amazing. amazing. And he wrote, so we wrote the movie. He, he <clears> set <throat> it up with Luke Ryan, who's an executive at MGM. Um, and Mary Parent was running the studio at that time with, a, with an executive um, uh, named Cale Boyder. And they were just crazy enough to make it. Like it I was, was about the, to say, like, this is the weirdest pitch it's like so weird. It's it crosses over like, yeah, it can, maybe it can work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were, you know, Kale and Mary and, and Luke were game. They were great. And they they understood the movie. They were like, this is totally ridiculous and funny. And and, um, you know, at its core, because there's also smart filmmakers, they understood that it was a midlife crisis movie. Right. It's a right. midlife crisis movie. Uh, but instead of like going to a dude ranch. Um, or going on a motorcycle like tour, they right. go into a hot tub time machine and have to relive their past, right? So the you know the but the the thematic ideas are the same. It's just that the you know the the engine um, or the journey through you know that that they take to explore those same themes is totally bonkers. You know, it's they go through a hot tub. So instead of city slickers or old, instead of city slickers or old dogs, you've got hot tub my machine. <laughs> yeah, which and so then it was like all self then it was very self-referential, right? They were all we were all the characters, the filmmakers, the audience, I think I think everyone there was something about that movie where everyone, you know, everyone understands that um or self-aware about the fact that it's totally bonkers. Like the notion of it itself is so ridiculous that everyone's invited to the party once they acknowledge that's the case. And so when you're the filmmaker or you're the audience or even the characters themselves, you're all enjoying the same thing, right? Right. Like, no one's going to take this seriously, right? I mean, I mean it's go, called hot tub time machine. <laughs> yeah, they go back in time in a hot tub. Like what? Yeah, it's like in every, just what you, the, even the way you just said it is just right. like, makes the whole thing worthwhile i think and so right it, and then, it, it, yeah no the thing that's brilliant about it is that it's so absurd that if you can't get past the title you won't enjoy the movie but if you can get past the title then you and you're in on the joke then you're just on for the ride and that's and that's exactly what that's so that's the brilliance of hot tub time machine i mean as i say it it sounds well, and, and I have to say, it was really courageous of Mary and Kale yeah, uh, to, to not change the title. You know, like there, we got a whole list of titles. It wasn't really? like they didn't consider it. Oh, yeah, we got a whole list of titles to consider because 
we, exactly what you said was exactly the case. Like when polled, right, they do all the market testing or whatever. And when you ask the question, would you ever see a movie called Hot Tub Time Machine? Well, I mean, the answer is obviously no. Like, right. you're not going to see a movie called Hot Tub Time Machine. But then when they show them Hot Tub Time Machine along with the materials, the trailer, the tone, the fact that it was an ironic title in that sense, then people are like, oh, yeah, I will see that because that's ridiculous and funny. And it, it and you're in on the joke, but like you're invited to the party called Hot Tub Time Machine because precisely because it's so dumb. And so once people understood that, um, you know, then then, every, you know, then then it, then it, then it all worked. But um, so then but then how do you get people to see it? Right. Because no one's going to admit that they're going to go see a movie called Hot Tub Time Machine. So, uh, you know, so hence they thought, well, maybe we should change the title so we don't have that barrier to entry. And Mary, I remember, I don't know if it's an, I, I don't think it's my imagination, um, but I remember being in a meeting and I, I just remember her saying that that she stood by the title, that that was what was fun about it. And that, you know, she was going to take the risk to go up, go to the market with that title and hope it worked. And I was like, that's super cool. She rolled the like, dice. Yeah, she yeah, rolled, she the, rolled the dice. And she was the head of the studio. And she was like, I'm, you know, I think that is the spirit of the movie. If you change the title, I'm not sure what you got, you know. And, and, and I think if there had been an alternative title that had been as compelling, then maybe that would have been a different story. But there wasn't one. And she wasn't willing to compromise, uh, you know, for another title that maybe would have attracted more audiences on on, on its face. But but would have just hurt the whole enterprise. And, and so, yeah, so that's, it's, hence hot to born. It, yeah. It's, it's kind of like the weekend of Bernie's of its generation, because that's another like ridiculous. I mean, even more ridiculous is the sequel of weekend of Bernie's because at that point you're like, how long has the body been dead? <laughs> kind of thing. That's right. You know, uh, but you know Clark least... Duke, I don't know if you interviewed Clark Duke. I don't I'm know. Not. He um he made a really great film recently as a director, and he um he actually has a brilliant uh weekend at Bernie's pitch, which someday I hope gets made. Oh my god, seriously. I won't I won't spoil it. You can ask him about it. It's one of the most brilliant remake ideas I've ever heard for that. Oh, movie. to remake to go back and remake it. Okay. Oh, yeah, to like do another weekend at Bernie's, but his but his approach to it is so brilliant. It's makes it, it's one of those ideas where like, well, only if you did that could you do it. Right. It's kind of like Cobra, it. like Cobra Kai. Like Cobra, yeah, like, like Cobra Kai. It has it ha they share sensibilities in terms of how it's approached. So you have to have Clark about it. And you got well I'll, yeah we'll definitely see if I can get him on the show because you know what I find funny about you know, as we've been talking about all the projects that we, you know, you know, you've done a lot of comedy in your in your uh, your filmography over the years, and I've worked with a lot of stand up comics. I've worked with a lot of, of comedians and things like that. People don't realize how serious the creators of comedies take the work. You know, something like Hot Tub Time Machine, you can kind of just write off of like, oh, it's just a bunch of silly guys doing a bunch of silly stuff. But just as you're explaining it. There's a tone of seriousness behind. No, this is a a coming not coming of age, but a midlife crisis film, and it's this and that. And yes, it's insane, and we understand it's insane. But this is why we're doing. So it's even when you're even when you you know go into the absurd, good comedies are ser are taken seriously on the back end behind the scenes. It's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, all the great comedies are really you know have have really kind of this, the emotional journeys of all the characters are central to the story, right? Like in every single one, like Tootsie, uh, oh. you know, Bridesmaids, um, like there are, um, you know, Judd, obviously all of Judd Apatow's work, like, um, the, you know, all the movies that I've done, like, I know contrary, contrary to popular belief, <laughs> comedy filmmakers are super interested in the, the story of the characters, you know? The, right. the characters and so and the and what they're struggling with emotionally we have to deal with it it's just that you know the way we deal with it is through these kind of heightened ridiculous you know circumstances so um yeah we you're you, you know like as you know if like you were to look at deep into my filmography I, the filmography there are movies where i didn't take that into take that to heart in ways i should have and the movie's not as good like there are movies that I've done that I think are far that it's like, okay, well, I'll just say like hot tub two, I think is far funnier, like pound for pound. It's actually a funnier movie, but it's not as good by virtue of the fact that, that you're not as in, you don't have as much rooting interest in the characters. What they're going through emotionally isn't as, you know, doesn't, it doesn't have as much substance. And so after a while, um, you know, it's just it, jokes, you struggle. Yeah. It's just jokes. And so, um, I, you know, I have a deep love of that movie and it's, and it's lunacy, 
But if you're just, if you're going to evaluate it in terms of like the character journeys, they're not quite as good. And so like, to me that, 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 you know, that's central to every good movie and, and comedy is no exception. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you look at something like, you know, 40 year old virgin. I mean, there's a lot of character in there. Yeah. There's lunacy and there's some fun stuff and there's great situations, but you're on the journey with this guy. You're on the journey with him. If not, it just jokes get boring after a while. I mean, you could only do so many jokes and so much at a certain point. I yeah, mean, like, that you can name every single one. Groundhog Day is like, oh, I mean, to learn brilliant. not to be, yeah, he has to learn not to be a selfish person. Like, we don't know why he's repeating the same day ever. There's no magic device that we're told exists. It just happens. <laughs> but we, but you slowly, but surely, we recognize that until he's not selfish, he's not, he's going to have to repeat every single day of his life. And, you, you know, Trading Places obviously has really, is a great, you know, friendship story about class. And race. Oh yeah, so um, many, so many different layers on trading places, or coming to America, or, or any of those, yeah. the, any of those early Eddie Murphy movies. Yeah, uh, uh, Wedding uh, Crashers. You know, like my favorite part of Wedding Crashers is when, um, you know, Vince Vaughn's like, "Come on, we'll do one more." You know, who cares? It'll be fun. That's what we do. We're Wedding Crashers. You know, we're young, and and then <laughs> Owen Wilson's like, "We're not that young." <laughs> And right. like, that, was the, that was the whole movie for me. You know, I was like, oh, now I'm interested because, yes, their time is the clock is ticking. Their 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 lifestyle is, um, you know, is unsustainable. And so right. now I'm really in. Right. They, they, they're they living a, a life that is unsustainable and they have to change. And they either are going to be either going to be forced into a change um, or they're going to you know, figure out how to make the change for themselves. And so like, that's the movie. And that's why I just love it and think it's so brilliant. Um, you know, um, that Bridesmaids again, it was one of my favorites because it's, you know, it's, you know, you could see the marketing material after hangover, you know, being similar to hangover, but when you see the movie, it's about a woman in a quarter life crisis who feels like she's about to lose her best friend to, you know, to, you know, she's about to, you know, her best friend has a new best friend. And what does it feel like to be left behind? Like that's to me the movie, mm -hmm. uh, and so then you know hilarity ensues. Um, so yeah, it's you know. it's it, comedies is a serious business. Uh, from working on them myself, I understand. It's like you, you know, timing and and uh, that's what makes a great comedy. Even something like Airplane, which yeah. is as absurd and it's one of my favorite comedies of all time there's still a character you still care i mean and that's as absurd of a movie as you can pretty much get uh the original yeah movie. and and there's a moment and i haven't seen that movie obviously in decades but i think there is there there is a moment <clears> where <throat> if you can be so absurd that you're also engaged in something else so then it doesn't have the same depth of character in the same way but you're again like i guess hot tub you're invited to this level of absurdity you're invited to this party where things are so crazy and so absurd that it has its own satirical um, it takes right. on a satirical tone. Like you're like, oh, all life is absurd, right? My life is absurd. Like my life could be airplane, you know, in any second, right? Like all it's of our lives could really be that any second. And so then you become the protagonist in a way to me when I watch those movies. I'm like, oh, I'm the protagonist because all these, you know, like every single ridiculous thing that's happening moment to moment, moment after moment after moment um, is just reminding me of how absurd life is. And so I, mean, I think that's a brilliant kind of comedy in its own right. Right. I mean, I, I picked the wrong day to stop sniffing glue. I mean, <laughs> amazing. I, I kept saying I, I picked the wrong day to stop doing cocaine. Like it was just so. Oh, Jeff um, Bridges, not Jeff Bridges, but um, uh, well, Bridges. Lloyd Bridges, right? Lloyd Bridges, Lloyd Bridges. Oh, yeah. oh so brilliant. Incredible. Now, with all of these things we've been talking about, which has been a lot of comedies, your newest film, The Wheel, hilarious. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> so tell me about The Wheel and how and, and why at this stage in your career did you want to tell this kind of story? Yeah, I mean, yeah, viewers be warned, there's not a laugh for a thousand miles in any direction. <laughs> There's no hot tub time machines. There's no, no there's no ironic hitman. <laughs> no, there's nothing of that. There's only emotional distress. Um, <laughs> right. I, you know, it was uh, the opportunity, you know, I, I always wanted, you know, like there's one always wants to explore what else is possible, you know, what else I think I could do well. Um, <clears throat> And this young producer, Josh Jason, who I work with on a commercial production, with, work within a commercial production company, brought me the script and I loved it. And um, the two actors that we found to play, Albie and Walker, Amber Midthunder and Taylor Gray, were extraordinary young people. And, um, you know, Josh had had 
um, come up with financing, which was, you know, very, you know, very, it's a micro indie. I mean, we spent nothing on that movie. The, 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 the picture vehicles, my stepfather's Jeep, um, all the furnishings <laughs> in the Airbnb that the young couple stays in are from my house. Um, you know, we shot the movie with, I think there were 20 of us total, 25 of us total with, with cast. And we shot it in 18 days. And and so I, you know, to do a, a story, um, you know, where, um, you know, I could I could explore dramatic arcs of characters was just something I wanted to see if I could do. And and then also, um, you know, have the freedom to try and um, create a visual world um, that was super small, um, but super resonant. Um, and, and it was COVID. Um, we were one of the first COVID movies. Uh, we uh, wrote, I think our COVID plan like ended up in the white papers or whatever, because we were one of the first people, we were some of the first little crew to write it. And I could have met, never made that movie uh, in any other time. Um, you know, we went up to the summer camp, which was closed because of COVID and we all quarantined. And then we, you know, we're just this little family up in the forest making this small and intimate little movie. And I was working with this young cinematographer, Bella Gonzalez, who's extraordinary. And we just, you know, it was just a wholly different kind of experience. Maybe one that I um, lost out on not having been a traditional film student because I, I came out of theater. I didn't come out of film. So it felt very much like theater theater, uh, or like doing a play, but I knew what to do with the camera um, now after all these years, or at least think I did. Um, and so um, it was an extraordinary experience, and I was so super happy to make that movie. Now, when when is the movie coming out? Movie just came out okay. just this weekend, um, and so you can get it on all the platforms. Um, uh, it seems like it's getting good placement. You know, part of you part of you um, agreeing to do this podcast, I'm sure helps will help us a great deal. Oh, please, thank so you. So all of those all of those listening, please go and see the movie. Um, is in theaters? Is in theaters, or is it going to be? No, it's, it's on. It's it's on streaming platforms. Okay. So Apple and Amazon and all the streaming platforms, you can go. You can go and watch it. Um, critics have been very nice to us, and that always feels good um, to me, um, especially since it's obviously commented often that you know in the reviews that I'm a comedy director and like you had no idea that I could do that. Um, you know, I don't know that um, I knew I could do it either. I just wanted to try to do it. Um, right. And I think that's part of what we're supposed to be doing um, as filmmakers. Um, and so, yeah. but I think as filmmakers too, I mean, we, you know, things that got, you know, got our juices flowing in our twenties is not what gets our juices flowing in our forties. And, you know, you want to kind of, you know, you've been there, done that on some things you want to like, you know what, I want to kind of challenge myself. You know, I went off and made my, I made a feature in like four days and wow. stole the entire movie at Sundance. While the while the festival was going on about filmmakers trying to sell their movie at Sundance, I'm like, I just want to go do this for fun. And if it fails, it fails because it costs three thousand dollars. It was no big deal. So, but that's amazing. What's it called? It's called On the Corner of Ego and Desire, and uh, and we shot it, you know, because it's it's exactly it, and it's the most absurd anything you've ever heard filmmakers saying is in this movie. Like the the lunacy, the insanity, the delusion. I wanted to kind of make a love letter to to independent filmmakers of how crazy we are and and trying to get to, so I I kind of just threw it all together and shot it and it was scary and to the point where my actors at the end were like do do, do you have anything I'm like I don't know I haven't, I haven't had time to look at anything I've been transferring stuff but I just don't know do you have a movie I'm like I think I have 70 some minutes let's hope and we were lucky enough to make 70 three minutes i think it was the whole movie that's but amazing the, can i see where can i see it yeah you can see it on amazon it's on oh, amazon right now yeah it's on freebie uh, it's on freebie on amazon and you could rent it and all that stuff I'll, I'll i'll tell you about it after but but i just use that as an example it's kind of like you just want to go out there and see what happens and you could do it at that budget range like you couldn't do that at a 40 or 50 million dollar budget range with big stars it's a little bit more pressure so i'm imagining doing it at this indie level really micro budget you get to go play which must have been a lot, a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was really freeing and it was cool. And, you know, it had all the same problems, you know, yeah. but <laughs> exactly. But you can, but you don't have, but you have no money hoes. So you have to right, figure it out. Right. We had no money. Um, and so, yes, we just had to figure out like what, like, you know, like because it was COVID, we had no background. Right. So we had to, I had to create frames oh, right. that felt full when there weren't people and things like that. There were all, there was a whole bunch of challenges, but they all, all the challenges felt really familiar. 
mm-hmm. you know, and I, you know, to have uh, Amber and Taylor, you know, and Bethany and Nelson Lee, the other two actors in the piece, um, be so game, you know, because it was so tiny and we, you know, mm-hmm. um, trying to create um, a world where these these two couples clash and, um, you know, are, you know, transformed by their interactions um, in ways that transform their lives and do it in all in this very kind of, you know, intimate way was a great was great challenge and was great fun. I'd like to do more of it. Now, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions, ask all my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker or screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Um, I would say um, that and this is true of me, even despite my lucky entrance, um, you know, the thing that you love and inspired by the most are the, is the thing that the thing that you should um, that you know more about than anyone else. Like there's this thought that, well, you, you know, you're not in the business, so you don't know anything. Right. But what you, you know, you don't know anything and anything in quotes means all the things that, you know, are the complexities and nuance of, of being in the movie business. But what you do know is what your idea is. You have command of your idea and you have command over what story you want to tell. And you have, and if you have the passion for it and the relentless, you know, <laughs> energy uh, to, to fight, to make it happen, that's, that's what your strength is. Like you are as important a filmmaker, frankly, and in terms of being the author of your own story as anyone else is like, so that's what you have to offer you have to offer your creative sensibility and your perspective, right? I mean, I felt very, maybe over, I'm sure I was massively overconfident, um, but I felt very strongly about my my um, perspective. You know, even Gross Point Blank, which we had a great, which we had a, you know, this glide path to making, I still had a very specific point of view. I was like, you know, this is a world in which, you know, if if you, like my kind of fundamental idea for that was like, for John is like, well, if you could be all that you could be in America, you become an assassin, like, because then you you can be morally ambiguous, right? You can be mm-hmm. amoral. You make a ton of money. You're your own boss. Like, what does America churn out as people? Like, well, they churn out assassins who end up really lonely and isolated. Like, that's what, but, you know, I'm not saying that's my perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, th- then my perspective was like, that is one version of what kind of human being comes out of American culture, right? And, right. I, and it was a very specific point of view. And so all the and so then all the ridiculous hypocrisies of that and all the funny things that flow from that, like a really neurotic character and all those things, that was just something that I could I could express, you know, right. it's simply express it to you today. And at that time, it was just a funny way to approach an antihero. Right. So, you know, and I was convicted. So then when people said, oh, well, you know, he can only kill. This is a good example. I think, you know, he can only kill good. He can only kill bad people. Right? That was like a rule that was trying to be imposed upon us. And we we resisted it because we're like, no, that's a like only killing bad people. That's a American hero. Like he is a more he doesn't kill only bad people. He's 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 a freelancer. He gets right. paid for people. He he, in fact, is deliberately taking a position that he doesn't care uh, what kind of person he's killing is. It's his job to kill them. And so. You know, that was something that we felt strongly about, that we fought for constantly, and that helped shape what the tone of the movie was. So so I think that, um, you know, I would tell a young filmmaker to have confidence that that thing that is, you know, waking you up every day and driving you to go and get made is the thing that you are the authority of and that you and, th- and that's what you have to offer. And that's a strength. That's not, you know, you don't, you know, I think when you walk into rooms, you know, it's not, you, you, sure, you're, you're asking people to pay attention and you're asking people to, um, to look at your work and embrace you. But at the same time, you're the one who has something to offer, um, something that we haven't seen before. Um, and that's what keeps, you know, our creative industry happening. Fantastic, so that, that fantastic be, answer. Sir. That would be my, that would be my rant. Um, if they make it this far in the podcast, they'll get it. Maybe you want to put that as a side <laughs> clip. Because like, they'll never get to this point in the podcast. Not My yet. friend, I've I've done three and a half. The record is three and a half hours. So you're still way, you're good. You're good. <laughs> mm-hmm. Awesome. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? 
the lesson that took me longest to learn patience, you know, I am patience with myself, you know, patience, even with my ideas, patience with everything, you know, um, and I'm even try to be patient when I'm shooting, you know, like I'll, you know, the first frame of any particular day I'm shooting, you know, that I did the very first setup of any given day, I have to remind myself to be patient. Like it's not going to happen instantly, you know, <laughs> I have to be patient. I have to see what happens in the frame. You know, we have to, we have to create the thing that we are here to create and it's not just going to happen and you can't be impatient. So I, I feel like even, so you have to have patience on every level, whether it's sh shooting, whether it's a day shoot or hoping you, your movie gets financed or being patient that, you know, you're, that the, a good idea is going to come to you you know, and you're not a complete failure who has no good ideas and should have never been in the movie business in the first <laughs> place. Like you need, so that I would say that's what I, that I need to learn in life. Um, and, and certainly in my career and I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at it. And three of your favorite films of all time. I mean, you know, that's the question. Everyone's like, what? I mean, I'll just keep rattling off. Three, just three that comes to mind right now at this moment. Uh, they shoot horses, don't they? Mm-hmm. Uh, Sidney Pollack's first film, uh, Harold and Maud, oh, Malawski, um, and wow, I mean, because I only get three, huh? <laughs> um, uh, Pulp Fiction. All very good choices, sir. Uh, Steve, man, it's been a pleasure talking to you, brother. Uh, congrats on all your success, and uh, I wish you the best with your new film, The Wheel. And thank you for making us laugh over these uh, over these years, man. I appreciate you, man. Thanks again. Yeah, man. Thanks. My pleasure. And congratulations. This is a great podcast, and I'm glad that you're doing it.